So just as a start, do you mind, um, Testing. while I set my levels, would you just say and spell your name, sure. please? Sure. Uh, J-A-M-E-S-S-L-E-E-P-E-R, James Sleeper, or Jim Sleeper, actually. Great. Is better. Okay. That's what I'll go by. It's that's Jim. that's great. Um, do you mind, uh, just as a start, yeah. oh, do you need that? No, 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 just so that I don't have to talk too loud. Okay. I just want to make sure you'll pick it up without my having to. Uh, yeah, no, we're Okay, we're, good. We're fine. Yeah. Um, do you mind starting just by giving me a kind of um, biographical thumbnail sketch? Who you are, where you're from, what you've done, what you're doing sure, now? Sure, sure. Well, presently I'm a part-time, I'm a lecturer in political science at Yale, and I'm a writer. I'm basically a writer. Is that coming through? Yeah, we're good. Ethnic and racial relations and politics in New York and nationally. Um, how's that? That's good. Yeah. Um, and it took me a long time to realize that what I think I've been doing all these years as a writer is looking for some kind of civic Republican tradition that is inevitably left in many ways but draws certain wisdom from certain kinds of conservative sources too. Certain things from Edmund Burke and others. Mm -hmm. The more deeply I think about what kind of country this is and how we might conceivably mobilize it, I think it's a country that is plagued by capitalist excess, uh, but that the only way to get at it uh, is through reaching into some deeper currents that are in the country itself that are not definably Marxist or definably left. And it's very hard to explain what that is, because mm -hmm. it sometimes me and I wind up criticizing uh, the progressive side. But of course I abominate what the conservative movement has become and, and what corporate and finance capital have become. Mm -hmm. And you know, there is a long tradition of American resistance to capitalist excesses that was not always only leftist. It was indigenous, some of it was southern agrarian. So I'm mucking around among these undercurrents, uh -huh. looking for traction points, ways to communicate with a public that might respond uh -huh. to those kinds of appeals. How would you describe your own, well, for your own kind of coming to consciousness politically, but also your political education? It's interesting. Uh, my parents were Hubert Humphrey Democrats, pro-civil rights, uh, then I grew up in the 50s and 60s that way. They were fans of Adlai Stevenson and so on. And when I came to Yale as an undergraduate in 1965, that's essentially what I was. And I think I was radicalized more by the Vietnam War than by the Civil Rights Movement, which of course I had supported, but in the, in the traditional liberal way. Mm -hmm. And um, it was in confronting what the American state was becoming in the Vietnam War that I really began to question a lot of the basic assumptions of the American Republic. And um, I began to, I spent years on the left and the activist uh, movement left as a consequence of that. I wrote for the Village Voice and began, I'm still on the editorial board of Dissent, the Democratic Socialist Quarterly. Um, and I think a lot of my journalism was always basically about rousing the people, awaking people. That kind of muckraking impetus with a progressive bent. Mm -hmm. um, lately, I don't know whether it's partly just because I get older or because my views of what's possible have been more nuanced. And we've learned some of this from watching Obama, what is and isn't possible and what its pitfalls are. Uh, my writing is m a little bit more reflective and I'm reaching for other currents mm -hmm. than the usual kind of movement mobilizing type of uh, writing that I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. So I'm struggling with that. That's, yeah. that's where I'm basically at. What's your own sense of, as a writer, who your public is or your publics? How do you think about the, the kind of fragmented electric, or electorate that we're looking at and who how do you define who you're trying to reach? That's a good question. I think the only public that I can reach because of the way I write are young and middle-aged. civic People who are interested in, in civic Republican leadership, that's small r on the Republican. You know. mm -hmm. People who are trying to figure out how you can balance the contending forces in ways that allow us to move forward people who are already aware of that dilemma 
and who are reaching for it. Now that can include community activists, organizers, I hope it does, uh, but I, I think it also includes uh, students and, and young people and those who already agree with me in older age. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a very large public that I'm reaching for anymore, although I still do newspaper work and still publish things for larger audiences and enjoy being in contact and dialoguing with them. Uh -huh. Do you still think it's possible to change minds with writing? Not with print as such. I mean, but I think we always overestimated. Maybe when Tom Paine wrote Common Sense, you know, print was the only medium there was, and, and so you changed minds and everyone was literate. Now people are illiterate. They're not illiterate, but they don't read seriously. Right. And they also, I mean, one of the things that's been so striking in the last, well, especially in the last decade, but I, probably in the last three um, since the coaxial cable probably is a turning point, that um, people have their kind of own boutique realities and they, yes. they cherry pick the available news. They are so entrenched in their own, their own data sets and their own That's views true. Um, that there's no really public comment anymore. And I wonder how you face that as a writer. That's, I, first of all, I agree with that. In fact, Shella Ben Habib says, it's as if people are walking around with bubble wrap around their brains <laughs> and they just let in what they want you know, to read. So I'm, I'm agreeing what you're saying. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely frustrated that way. I find that the general mass media is so corporate dominated that I find it harder and harder to get published there, except sometimes when the stars align right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wind up uh, blogging in places like Talking Points Memo which has a political junkie, left of center, polishy wonkish readership. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so there is a certain amount of preaching to the converted or holding internal debates. I think all I can do, or the way I meet it, is I try and pitch what I'm writing to those who are trying to reach a mass audience but who check in with places like the ones I write for to take their bearings. I write with them very much in mind. I do not write to preach to the converted, preach to the choir, to rouse the people who already agree with me. I write to be a little counterintuitive and pull in those who I know are just kind of peeking into the site uh -huh. and say, here are some things you ought to carry back to the mainstream. Uh -huh. um, so it's very nuanced in that sense. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, I get good responses from people, you know, all of these blog sites have three audiences. There's those who post the comments, which run the gamut from the ridiculous to good. And then there are those who um, write to you personally. There are peop many people read this, these sites and would never post a comment, but they do read them. And they Xerox, they, they print it out. And then there are those who uh, uh, will link you and, and comment on what you're saying somewhere else. So those three layers make it reasonably satisfying. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the old days when I did a column for the uh, New York Daily News, I could ride home on the subway and watch people reading my column, but I never felt that it had all that much impact. <laughs> I'm not so sure that the bass audience really converted into political mobilization. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It was kind of a distraction, a moment's entertainment on the subway or whatever. Right, okay. Well, let's talk about this current moment that we're in uh, in the U.S. I've been traveling around talking to all sorts of different people and the phrase this current moment has a lot of weight and a lot of power people get very passionate um, that about the idea that this is uh, an extraordinary moment in in many ways there's no consensus at all about what's important about it what's significant what's interesting but there is this wide sense from right to left uh, and in between that this is an extraordinary moment when I say that phrase to you, what, what comes to mind? What, what is it about this moment that, that um, strikes you? Frankly, uh, Edward Gibbons' description of the moment when Augustus was leading Rome from being a republic into an empire, I think that during the Bush years, especially if we, if we roll this moment back just a few years and, and take the past five years, this moment is a time when we still have the forms and institutions of a republic, but the centralization of power 
and the swiftness and darkness of the strong undercurrents that are anti-Republican is really frightening. Uh -huh. I sense that in the media, of course, we sense it in the industrial, you know, the healthcare and military industrial nature of things. I feel that um, there is a kind of corporate ethos which has nothing to do with the lock-in entrepreneurial capitalism that one might have supported and is really frightening. And I think this current moment is a moment in which we are on the verge of losing the soul as well as the institutions of a vigorous Republican small r, Republican polity, where people are vigorously engaged in self-government. I think people are vigorously engaged in distractions like Tea Party explosions and things like that that is not self-government. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, Alexander Hamilton had a great quote, a great remark in one of the Federalist Papers where he said, it seems to have been left to Americans to decide the important question whether a people can really govern itself through reflection and choice or whether, or whether it will always have to depend for its political constitution on accident and force. You know, this is that moment. Uh -huh. We're figuring out whether we're going to be able to keep this. And it really does depend ultimately on a vigilant citizenry and there isn't any ideology or set of institutions that can guarantee that spark right. of vigilance and virtue and balance in people. The American Republic was always staked on that. And it reached it only in the breach. It was often worse than that. We know there have been many terrible moments of mob violence, of breakdown. So I console myself with that, uh -huh. that I say, well, is this current moment really more perilous than McCarthyism was or than World War I when the government was almost totalitarian? I don't know the answer to that. Uh -huh. Are there anything, well, so let's parse this out a little bit. First of all, are you hopeful? Um, I'm hopeful without being optimistic. I am hopeful. I, I still, in other words, I still think it's possible. I do think the Obama campaign, while it has led to many disappointments, it was more than an extended Michael Jackson performance in which a bunch of kids on the internet got excited. Um, it was more than that. There was something really stirring in the public. I don't think it's been well sustained mm -hmm. or well organized, but that really made me feel that I was not alone. After the 2004 election, when Bush was reelected, I think many of us really thought, you know, we're heading into a, a tunnel that it's going to be hard to come out of. Uh -huh. And um, the Obama campaign lifted that fear and opened things up again. But since then, I think we're learning, those of us who may have had some illusions, um, that the office of the presidency is constrained and driven by powerful confluence of forces that he alone cannot uh, turn aside. Right. So yeah. um, in that sense, I'm, I'm hopeful that if this dawning awareness that we all have can lead to a second kind of movement with new leadership, not just his, I don't know, but somebody, some others, the combination of wise leadership and a new stirring, I'm hopeful. Uh -huh. Okay, let's, before, we'll talk about the first year of the Obama administration, but let's back up and talk yes. about um, that wave of hope from roughly maybe February to November of 08. There's yes. that, the, the campaign season, first the primaries and then the general election. Can you tell me your experience of those months, what you saw, what you felt, um, what your sense of possibility was during that time? I started out early in 2008, um, probably very worried. I was still haunted by the 2004 election and what had ensued, the miserable four years of Katrina and all that. And um, I wasn't sure that Hillary Clinton would survive the Fox News, uh, you know, right, vast white ring conspiracy, <laughs> as she called it. I, will, I don't call it that, but I understand why she said that. I thought these forces are so powerful that once again we're going to watch the Democrats fight each other and then get slaughtered. 
So I started out skeptical and thinking that maybe on balance Hillary was best, but I felt doomed. I would never warm to John Edwards. I don't know why. I had a visceral feeling that I, while he was saying the right things, I just didn't click with him. Um, Obama, I was watching, but like many other people, especially me as someone who spent years writing about racial and ethnic politics, here I am, the great champion of transracial hope, you know, in terms of the things I write, the antithesis of identity politics, and yet I thought, but the country isn't ready, you know. And I remember what I was going around saying to people early in 2008 was, it's an actuarial question. How many of the people who will never pull the lever for a black man are still alive. <laughs> you know, we have to wait for a layer of people to just pass from the scene before a guy like this can get elected. And I said, I don't know if we're there yet. As I listened and watched uh, his cadences and the poetry of the campaigning, I realized that he was hitting all the right notes that mattered to me. And I became a, a strong, hope, hopeful supporter of his. And I watched him go through his trials with Jeremiah Wright and all these other things. And, um, and I began to just really see that something was coalescing around this guy that, frankly, it was everything that I felt that I had been saying in my books and in my journalism, and there had been no one to point to. I was just always saying how Al Sharpton was getting it wrong or how, you know, this one or that one. Here was a guy who got it. And, um, and clearly... What was exciting to me was that a lot of other people got it. It wasn't just me writing the closest of strangers or liberal racism. He got it, and other people were warming to it. it there was something post-racial about it, his dogged refusal to get down into that muck. I loved that. Um, there were people to my left who were saying he can't be really a representative of the right things. And, you know, I wound up feeling okay. He is one-third Harvard neoliberal. He's one-third Chicago Paul, neither of which two things I admire very much. But you have to have that to get elected. And he's one-third legatee of the civil rights movement, community organizer, Reinhold Niebuhr, you know, wise man. And I said, the two-thirds are often going to outvote the one-third, but this is the best we're going to get. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I felt. Do you remember the moment that you first thought, wow, this guy could win? Um, I don't know that there ever was a moment. I really was haunted by the actuarial question. Uh -huh. And um, remember, toward the end, the polls were so weird. I think I was always on tenterhooks. I was never going around saying he's going to clinch it. And you remember, I mean, I'm sure many others have mentioned this, that in the week before the election, everybody's mood was going up and down, despite the nuttiness of Palin. And, and you could see all the neocons sort of defecting and, you know, saying, whoops, this isn't what we bargained for when uh -huh. we joined the right. But you thought, oh my God. So, no, I, I, I know that there was a moment when I felt that he deserved to win and that he was playing it right. But I just was never one of those people who thought, oh, this is going to happen. Yeah. Can you describe some of what you saw around you? You were on a college campus through that period? or uh, Yeah, basically in New York and at Yale, basically. Uh -huh. Well, um, that's right, yeah. And were you sensing a different kind of response among your students to Obama than you had seen before? Yes. Students were warming to him regardless of whether they were moderates or leftists or something. And even some of the quote-unquote honorable conservative Republican types, he was turning their heads. They were kids who had taken their own liberal education seriously enough that they picked up on certain resonances. And I remember talking with a couple kids who had been in the party of the right in the you know, political union. And they just felt that he had a certain nobility, a certain character. They recognized what it meant to be a black man coming through. They were not racist in their inclination. They realized that this was something formidable. Mm -hmm. And they were embarrassed by Palin. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, and I actually know, 
I, I can mention this because it's not private. I've mentioned it in the TPM post. Scott McConnell, who was the editor of the American Conservative magazine, was campaigning for Obama in Virginia in November, in the, in the end of October. These are people who, and some kids at Yale were like that, they just felt that he was saying something they believed in. And to me, what it was was this civic Republican kind of thing, the idea that we're all, we're not just in a republic where we have checks and balances and representatives, but there's something that binds us together. There's a political culture that has to be nurtured uh, with certain ideas of justice and fairness that we may disagree about how to apply them, but we spend some energy doing that. Obama was rejuvenating that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's what I felt. Yeah. And I saw people around Yale responding to that. Uh -huh. So what's been your assessment of the first year of this administration? Here we are, almost a year to the day, a year and a week into the administration. I'm one who was inclined to give him a lot of slack at first. I did not approve of the Gaetner and Summers, the economy stuff. I'm not an expert on the, uh, the economy, but I thought he went a little too far to the center. I knew he had to reassure a lot of people and that um, he had to play his cards very carefully. I think he erred too much on the side of caution there. Um, and I think that in many other ways he kind of lost his momentum. This wonderful networked support movement that he had built had to be turned into a political organization. They kind of dropped the ball. They decided to play the inside Beltway game. I think on the health care thing, I'm one of those who felt he gave too much over to Congress. Uh, I think he should have gone for it. Uh, I think he was right to try and do health care and get it through, but I think he could have rammed it through instead of letting them dither as much. Mm -hmm. Not quite rammed it through. Right. Um, I also feel I contrast him with FDR in the following sense, precisely because FDR was a son of the plutocracy, had grown up with great wealth. He had a certain aristocratic self-confidence so he could get up in Madison Square Garden in 1936 and say, the bankers hate me and I welcome their hatred. Barack Obama, we soon discovered, it cannot do that. First of all, if a black man just arches an eyebrow, people think he's full of rage. But secondly, he himself did not grow up with that sense of uh, aristocratic entitlement. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't quite do what even Ted Kennedy could do, which is rail against the powers that be. Uh -huh. I think we wanted to see a little of that. Are we beginning to now? I mean, with the State of the Union address and then his meeting with, uh, with the Republican caucus last week, those, the tenor of, of both of those events was different from what we've seen in the previous yes. year. Yes. How, how portentous is that in your view? I think it's his best and highest card. I don't think he'll ever be convincing as an out-and-out -out populist. I think what was convincing in the State of the Union message and in the meeting of the Republicans in Baltimore was his civic Republicans saying, look, let's stop trying. You know, He called them on their tactics in front of everyone. And he wasn't he didn't really denounce them as a bunch of plutocratic money changers, which I would have loved. He didn't do that. He basically said, you have ideas, I have ideas. He tried to embarrass them by standards that everyone does profess to hold, that most people, the standards of fairness and decency and equity and debate. Um, is, is that going to have traction with this crowd? No. I think it, I think it helps him. Because I think a lot of Americans did watch, and they said, I believe that too. And I do think the Republicans and the Fox News shouters have gone a little too far. But will those people stop doing it? No. And they will be right back to it, and they will be appealing once again. He may have given a couple of them a mild crisis of conscience, but I think that the undercurrents in this society are really bad now. We have a malevolent transformation to use a term that the psychiatrist Harry Stack Sullivan talked about. People's wiring is thanks to a lot of things that are going on, and I do think that Fox News is part of it. I do think that the right-wing media assault plays on people's weaknesses and accustoms them to processing information in terms of fear and mistrust. 
and there's no incentivization to do it otherwise because there's a lot for these people to be mistrusting and fearing. They got the wrong target, though. And, and those people, once you become psychically wound up in processing information that way, you would feel almost like a chump if you turned over to a more positive kind of constructive way of doing like he did in the campaign. Uh -huh. And I think that um, this is the great danger. I don't think he alone. He can set an example and he can be very instructive. And I think he was that in the State of the Union and in the thing colloquy with the Republicans. But I think the undertoes are so powerful that it's going to take more personal witness on the part of more people against those undertoes. Uh -huh. What's your sense, as a journalist, what is your sense of people like Glenn Beck, Bill O'Reilly, um, the Fox News shouters, as you called them? Right. Do they believe what they're saying? Or is this, is this a ratings game? Is it half and half? How do you understand their view of the world and their own understanding of the things they say? I think that ratings lust has driven them to believe that they believe what they're saying. In other words, I think they're reaching for a hot button. They have, I think intellectually they're very confused. If you really could get them in an ideal speech situation in which you were debriefing them on what they really believe, after reciting the usual conservative knee-jerk pieties, you would find that they're very confused and that they don't really know what they believe. But they do have these irritable mental gestures, as Lionel Schilling once said, that seek to resemble ideas. And uh, they are very, very committed to those gestures. They do get so much reinforcement in terms of the audiences for doing that. Uh -huh. So I think whatever they, they began with certain beliefs, Reagan Democrat type beliefs. Oh, I'm a good guy, I'm basically a populist, but, you know, these liberals have screwed it up. They began telling themselves that. They believe that. But the ratings lust has overtaken and overdetermined their commitment to staying with it uh -huh. and saying it. It's a feedback loop that's reinforcing itself. Uh -huh. I would like to think that after Katrina and after the miserable things in Iraq and after the meltdown in the economy, that they would finally have pinched themselves. But they, they don't yeah. seem to be able to. Well, and the, the more astonishing thing is how much kind of ideological space they occupy with, uh, on, on the right side of, of things. I mean, they've become really important to the Republican Party yes. in a way that's um, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. Yes. Um, among among uh, elected officials, I mean, are there any Republicans who you still look to for some for some sense of, of the kind of, of civic-mindedness that you're talking about? No, I'm sure there are some. I think we saw in Baltimore they're very good at pretending to be choir boys when they get up and address the president in front of the nation. They can sound civic Republican. We want to dialogue with you. We have these. But no, I don't think, I think the, the, the thoughtful ones have been driven out of the party for the most part, or they've look at these purity tests that they're now experimenting with the Republicans. They're trying to draw up a list of standards and unless you meet 8 out of 10 uh, you won't be supported by the party in your campaign. That's a real litmus test that forecloses thought. It just um, short circuits any kind of honest debate. So I don't have much hope for the Republicans. Um, I don't know where it's going to come from. Yeah. Does that you asked something else with that question? Though I'm not sure. Uh, <coughs> no, I was just curious um, because I know that um, you know who I felt thought that saw this. I think if Sam Tannenhaus tells the truth when he writes Buckley's biography when he finally publishes it, mm -hmm. William F. Buckley I think was in despair at the end of his life. I think he saw what it had come to. He did not like these Bill O'Reilly type mm -hmm. people. Uh, we know from his own Crossfire program, he had a different manner. Mm -hmm. He sustained friendships across ideological divides, 
I mean, I didn't. I thought his ideas were fatuous, but he at least believed in a certain civility. Uh-huh. And I think he looked at what both the Republican Party and the conservative movement had become. Apparently, he said to Tannenhaus or someone, "We should never have let the neocons in." <laughs> you know, he really was despairing. Yeah, just Let me just ask you one last thing. We yeah. haven't talked yet about the uh, the economic collapse. Um, yeah, what's what's been your experience of that? Um, you know, when I was talking to someone uh, who lives here in New York who's unemployed, and she said and it's really haunting and bizarre because um, you can read about the scale of the crisis in the newspaper, but when you kind of there's no there's no kind of public markers of it other than vacant real uh, real, uh, real estate around the city but you don't see bread lines you don't see no. you don't, there aren't the, the kind of, of uh, visual markers in our public culture the way there uh, the way there were in the depression um, and so what's your what's your sense as a New Yorker about well you know? I'm living in Midtown now so and I'm a good observer of the cityscape not only though those vacancies all along Fifth Avenue and Madden, but uh, the traffic is lighter on the streets too. The car traffic is lighter because not as many people are coming to work. And it happened at New Year's. Many people had leases that ran out at the end of the year. Businesses staggered on to the end of the year. We got back from a couple weeks away in January, and I really noticed it. Now, what that means to me, those vacancies mean a lot of people are sitting home frantically sending out their resumes secretarial type people lower management people and they're not finding any so I don't know if that will lead to bread lines but I think a lot of people are right now running through the very very last of what they've got so I think it's getting worse yeah, I, I, I think the visible markers I guess my answer to your question is we may see soup line <laughs> I hope it won't come to that we're going to see more visible markers soon I'm experiencing it as a writer um, the publishing industry is in a tailspin. It doesn't even know what it's going to do. And one of the, I think we writers are going to be back like on Grub Street or a Balzacian or a Trollope. It's going to be, we're going to be begging for crumbs. Um, you know, magazines that would pay you $5,000 for an essay are no longer there. Uh-huh. And uh, they know that you'll write for free because you you got to write, you got to write, you want your audience. That's how they're treating us now. Sorry, we can't pay you. I joke that for blogging at TPM, I make minus one dollar a word <laughs> because of the time I take to spend writing. They don't pay anything, so you know. And I have to Xerox my, you know. It, it, it's um, that can't go on forever. Yeah. I mean, I have a, some savings, and I do through my teaching, but. Uh, I think a lot of people like us who don't have the benefit of tenure are, uh, you do, right? Yeah. 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 God bless you. <laughs> you know, but those who don't, I think they're really on thin ice now just keeping up appearances. A year from now, who knows? Yeah. What do you think? I mean, are, are you, you must be you're talking with people. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think I agree with you. It's it's going to get worse before it gets better, and I think, in part, I think it's already worse than we know yes, in a certain way. I, agree. I mean, I think there are a lot of people living with their families. I mean, there's a kind of hidden unemployed. That's right. That um, that can only go on for so long. That's right. Um, and I think you know the number of people who are one paycheck away from crisis is enormous. Um, I think the number of people, as Obama said in the State of the Union, the the number of people who are one illness away from crisis is enormous. Um, But I do think there's the kind kind of hidden homeless, and I don't know how many millions of people we're talking about, but I think it's a lot. That's right. You know, who are um, people who have graduated college, who are back living with their parents, um, uh, people older than that who are either, you know, have had a career or have had half a career and now are, are living with relatives. Or I mean, there's a... There's, uh, I think, more going on that's than right. meets the eye. Yeah, that, that's my sense also. I mean, our, our daughter is 24, and she's at LSE now, so everything is in abeyance. But, you know, what she sees among her peers, it's not good. And, and you see in the columns that the kids write in the Yale Daily News, they are scared. They're lining up for interviews with the banks and Goldman Sachs. 
It's not that they believe in it, but they they want to make something. They don't, they see nothing else out there. Uh-huh. I don't know what I don't know what form it's going to take. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Well, this has been great. Is there anything that you feel that we should have talked about that we didn't touch on? Uh, nothing is jumping out. I'll probably think things will come to me over lunch, which you know <laughs> then it'll be too late because it'll be noisy down there. Um, no, I just really worry that it's just what we're saying. My sense is that beneath the surface, while people are keeping up appearances, we are headed for something really scary politically. And that there nobody, I thank God that Obama is in the White House, but, you know, David Brooks, who is my least favorite person as a columnist, had a call the other day that was exactly right. He said, Ross Perot is coming. He didn't mean the Ross right, Perot. Right. He said, somebody's going to be popping up soon saying, the Democrats can't solve it, the Republicans are ridiculous, I'll solve it. And I think people are going to go for that. If with the right kind of folksy spin. and Is it inconceivable that uh, Sarah Palin is that person? I think it's inconceivable. But look at, we had Jesse Ventura and Arnold Schwarzenegger elected. You know, that's not inconceivable. Right. Somebody like that. She's a little too far gone, but um, she... One really can hope. Well, with that, thank All you right. very much. My pleasure. Now let me treat you to a nice one. Now let me treat you to a nice one. Now let me treat you to a nice one. Now let me treat you to a nice one. Now let me.